All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Kensida's fourth live webinar on event efficiencies. My name is Jill Clark, and I'm the Athletic Communications Coordinator at the University of Toronto, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I'd ask that everyone ensure they are muted and encourage you to use the chat function to ask any questions you have along the way. This is meant to be a presentation with a lot of discussion, so please don't be shy. We're happy to have our resident expert, Elisa Mitten, as our speaker today. Elisa has been at the University of Windsor for 18 years. She may hold the sports information title, but her duties for the Lancers encompass so much more. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Elisa. Thanks, Jill. Um, hi, everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen with you. And presentation mode. Is that good? Okay. All right, well, thank you, Jill, and hello, everybody. Nice to see you all again. It's been a month. Um, I hope everyone's doing well, uh, especially my friends in Ontario during our third lockdown. Um, you know, as Jill said, I've been at the university for 18 years now, 16 as the SID, but all 18 years have been involved, I've been involved in hosting our events. I've hosted a vast range of events, anywhere from you know a regular season game to hosting two championships at the same time and all the way to the Pan Am Junior Championships and the Olympic Trials in track and field. Um, so, you know, a typical game day for me can see us, as I said, running anywhere just from one uh, regular season game to two basketball, two volleyball and two hockey games, um, all within a six hour time span of each other in multiple locations. So some of my challenges, you know, as I said, include running multiple games in multiple locations, running multiple webcasts, social media, tickets, game recaps, stats, sharing our, figuring out how to share our social, one social media channel with all six games that are going on at the same time. Um, now, for me, thankfully, I don't need to worry about any of the facilities set up, um, for example, setting up the benches and the nets and the water and stuff like that or uh, any of our in-game promotions. Um, I assist with our promotions and I did do them up until up a few, a few years ago, but then with the hiring of our new marketing coordinator, uh, she thankfully took them on. Um, so today I just wanna go through some tips and tricks that I use to help me run um, what is hopefully a smooth and successful event. Um, but please know that not everything goes perfectly for me all the time. Um, I do have experience in it, but um, everything is not perfect every single day. Uh, that is not the case, but I still do rely on some of these things to help keep things running as smoothly as possible. Um, and as Jill said, we, I would love for this to be um, an inclusive and more of a conversation today. So, you know, please ask questions throughout and offer suggestions as well. If there's something you do uh, well at an event that works for you, please share it with the group. I would love to hear it and learn from you uh, myself. Um, so the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is planning. Um, for me, it is all about planning. Um, I need to lay everything out in one place uh, when I get um, our schedule. So for example, I put in all of our games, I highlight all of our major events, um, all of our big social media campaigns. And then if any of our key people are away, um, I also list it all there as well so that we can uh, work around that and accommodate that in advance. Uh, some of the tools I use to help me do that, uh, this here is called Team Up. Um, it's an electronic online calendar for groups. Uh, during the season, normally this would have all of our uh, sporting events listed as well as all our promotions plans and social media campaigns. But this here is our calendar from this past March. Um, and because we don't have any games, it's listed everything that we were doing on the website and online on social media and our video channels. Um, it's great because you can uh, break it down into specific calendars, you can color code everything, you're able to put in a specific time frame that things are happening on, as sure, well as, as, well as no. who is responsible for that. Um, and then if you do click on that event as well, you can see further details if uh, you need to share it. And then as well, because I am a bit old school, um, I am all about the paper and the pen and writing everything out. So this here are the calendars in our event office. Um, what we do every year is, again, when we get scheduled, we lay it all out in front of us and we can go four months in advance so we can see what we have 
uh, coming up and we color code it there as well. Um, I like doing this because our team of up calendar is only for our senior student staff um, and the people more kind of involved in the planning of the day to day. But this one here, our entire event staff and everyone is able to see it so they know what we have coming up and what's going on. Uh, something else, you know, with planning that's important is you need to think ahead. Uh, for example, in the summer, I take the opportunity to go through all of our coaches records and our players records to see if anyone's coming up on a record that they might potentially break, uh, break, or they might hit a milestone, for example, a coach hitting 150 wins or 200 wins in the OUA. Um, and then what I do is I put a reminder in my calendar so that two weeks before the season starts, I get a pop up that says, you know, Coach Valet, six wins away from 200 OUA victories. I go, oh, perfect. And then I'm able to either talk to the coaches if it's about a player, talk to my social media kids, talk to my graphic designers, and we get everything uh, in line so that when it does happen, we're able to have the graphic and everything ready to go right away. If it ha happens at home, we have a post-game celebration um, ready to go. It just help, helps in, so that if you do find out the day before, you aren't really able to uh, plan that much ahead. So just thinking ahead with that. Um, we also rely a lot on checklists in our area. Um, I work with, to set up an event, the facility person, Trevor, as well as Mona, our marketing coordinator. Um, so we have between the three of us an overall checklist um, that for game days that literally has everything for all areas on it. And it talks about what time each of those things need to be completed by. It, needs, it talks about who's going to complete it. And then it breaks it down for um, teardown as well. And we hand it in to me at the end of every event. Um, and then we also, each of us have our own specific area checklist as well. Uh, for example, my event team, not only do we talk about, you know, we checklist on pre and post game setup and teardown, but it talks about webcasting equipment, tickets, if there were any issues uh, with anything at all, it's kind of like an overall game report that gets submitted when they send in uh, our ticket stuff at the end of the night as well. So we can address those in advance and be prepared for the next day. But as all things, you know, you can plan all you want, but sometimes things don't go as planned. So you need to learn to just, well, you got to roll with it. And I'm going to give you an example of one of the events that we planned, 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 and it did not go as planned because it was, um, so it was a hockey outdoor classic. A number of years ago, the NHL hosted the Red Wings and the Maple Leafs at um, Michigan Stadium for their annual outdoor game. And Olympia Entertainment, owner of the Red Wings and the Tigers, uh, decided to do a hockey series as well at Comerica Park. So they built an outdoor rink and hosted minor teams, you know, to play games there, Michigan State and Michigan and uh, Wayne State all played games there. And we were lucky enough as well um, to get in there and play a regular season game against Western at the event. So it happened on December 14th. Uh, it was on a Sunday and um, we met with the organizers multiple times, uh, had conference calls with them. We went over there and we did a site visit. We laid out our plans. We laid out our schedule for the day to them, provided them with all of the information. We um, thankfully had no issues getting our staff across the border. Now, mind you, I had to only schedule staff who had a passport um, and that so that at the time limited me to our local uh, event staff because a lot of people who from out of town at the time didn't have um, a passport on them. Anyway, on the day of the event, we arrived and um, the organizers looked shocked to see us. The dressing rooms were not ready. They couldn't believe we were there so early. We were only there two and a half hours before game time like we normally would. Uh, the credentials weren't ready. They ended up moving our ticket booth location three different times. And then after moving it the second time, told us that our event staff couldn't sell the tickets, that their staff ended up having to do it. Um, so keep in mind, I've now brought additional people across an international border to the game to work this. And it was minus 100 degrees outside, but it was freezing. <laughs> and uh, as well, they didn't have the Canadian national anthem for us and the Lions were playing directly across the street uh, at Ford Field there. So they their game finished just as we were starting. So parking for us was just a nightmare. 
But as all of this was happening, we learned to roll with it. And what we ended up doing was taking our ticket staff and putting them at all the different gates around Comerica Park so that if someone came up because the location changed three times, we were able to point them in the right direction. And then that way they actually had something to do and I wasn't paying them to do nothing. Um, and then for the anthem, this has happened to me multiple times, but we ended up playing the anthem on one of our cell phones and putting the microphone that they provided to us up to it. So it wasn't the greatest uh, situation. I did have a conversation with their organizers afterwards, but uh, we made the best of it. Unfortunately, we didn't win the game, but uh, it was an amazing experience that I know our athletes um, really, really enjoyed and appreciated. So something else I find uh, so important, and I know all of you will agree to this, is communication. If communication is open, if communication is honest, if communication is free flowing, everything goes far, far better. Um, but if it's not, then you come into a lot of difficulties. Um, so what we do is uh, we meet at the beginning of the year, prior to every season um, with our coaches, we meet with our event staff, we meet as a department um, and we meet with all the parties involved and we go over our expectations, rules and regulations, our emergency action plan, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And then if things do obviously uh, change throughout the year, we have follow-up meetings or emails just to keep everyone at the same page. Um, one of the most important things I've learned in life, not just in this job, is to never assume. Never assume that people know things. Never assume that your technology is going to work. Um, never assume your staff is going to show up. You, you need to be prepared for all of these different situations and communication is a, part, a big part of that. Uh, for example, you know, with technology, an example is never assuming, you know, that Hootsuite is going to actually post it, even though you've asked them to at a certain time. We've had over the last couple of months, you know, post scheduled in Hootsuite, and it just hasn't gone up. So make sure you're communicating with uh, your staff and making sure someone's double checking that uh, things are scheduled and actually goes through at the same time. Uh, some of the things we I do are is I send weekly emails and correspondence um, to my staff. It they involve reminders list of important items. Um, I find this holds our staff accountable because if they don't read the communication and then there are spe specific instructions in there, it is on them. Um, we don't, obviously it doesn't help you in the moment that they weren't prepared and it's, you know, at the time hurting you, but you are able to hold them accountable and can follow up with them in the future and adjust accordingly if you need to. Now for large events, championships and stuff, it, I find that it's important to meet months in advance. And if you've never hosted this championship before, um, a year ahead of time, so, to, so you can determine your task list for everyone and meet regularly um, as a whole group, as well as individually. Um, something we now do is this here is um, a duty list that was given to us in our department when we were awarded the Women's Basketball Championship. For the first time 10 years ago, um, we met as an organizing committee and our athletic director, Gord Grace at the time, walked in and handed us all this piece of paper and said, these are your duties. This is what you're supposed, to, this is what you're going to be working on. Um, so we were able to break off. We knew who was doing what, there was no uh, confusion there. You could see who else was working on the same things as you so you could work together. Um, and then we would meet as smaller groups and then come back and report on our areas. Um, at our weekly meetings as well. I found this list really helpful um, at the time because there was so much that we all had to do that thankfully, you know, we had this and then I've implemented this uh, going forward as well. Now, something I do to talk to my uh, senior event staff um, and social media staff uh, on a regular basis to keep us um, on the same page is we use a, an app called Slack. Um, it's a communications app it's faster than email, but it's more focused than a chat app. You can keep conversations and you can share files with key people in one place. And you can have your conversations broken down into specific areas. So if you see here on the left-hand side, those are channels. Those are the different uh, topics you can have. So you, we can have graphics, general, social media. And what we do, if we're gonna be talking about, you know, our YouTube uh, mini series that's coming up with our coaches close up, Connor just sent in our channel, you know, the, the um, draft of Kevin Hamlin's thing, uh, video, it just came through now. And then we're all able to watch it, look at it and reply our feedback all in one space. So he's not being one bombarded with emails. He gets the replies right away. And we all know 
what each other is saying and on the same time. We have found this, we've implemented this over the last year and I found this very, very helpful for us. It keeps us really, really organized. Does anyone have any questions right now? We're good. Okay, we'll move on. Um, so next for me is event staff and volunteers. Um, the event staff are my life. I couldn't do everything that I need to do as the SID and home event manager without them, uh, especially uh, my senior student staff. Now our senior student staff is broken down into two areas. Um, we have, I have them broken down into home events and our social media promotions. Um, I rely on these senior students to help me manage and execute everything that we have on our plate. Um, they help us oversee the other student staff, set up game operations, social media updates, and our in-game promotions. Now, some tips for hiring uh, student staff. These things I've found helpful over the years, and hopefully some of you have been able to do the same uh, or can implement it. Um, so we, I hire a lot of former athletes who are no longer with their teams. And I know some of you may be uh, nervous about that, but I ensure that there are no issues and hard feelings with the split uh, from the team. And I always confirm with the coach that they're okay, that their former athlete would be working the table or the scorer's box. Um, also student athletes who are out of season are really handy for me. For example, uh, football and soccer players, I hire them um, and they work after their season at volleyball, basketball, track and field and hockey. Um, they understand the importance of clock. They understand the importance of stats. They understand like all the little intricacies. And then they also see all the hard work that goes into what you do and what it takes to run a game. So they have a more of appreciation and they actually have a stake in the whole event. So, and what goes on in the department. So I find that they're really reliable um, athletes who really get engaged and get involved. Um, some other Things is friends and younger siblings of your top student staff. I know I have a few senior students that have siblings coming in. Uh, so I definitely always recruit them and give them a try. I always give them the opportunity. And then if it's not a fit for them, then that's okay. But if they're anything like their senior, you know, their sibling who is playing a senior role in my life, then I want them on my team. Um, we also, util I also utilize our school's work study program. Um, now for us, I don't know how it is for everybody else, but we're very lucky and we can hire any student um, that is in good standing and um, has a minimum course load. They don't need to be uh, under financial need or anything like that. So to me, it opens up the window to the entire university student pool, which is very helpful for me. And then we also use Canada summer jobs. I don't know if everyone has heard about that. It's something new, um, but there's a longer time frame. Uh, to hire them and there's more money per student so you can actually um, it bridges the gap with the work study what the work study doesn't fill as well so we are able to use both of those and then another thing we oh that's for volunteers okay so i also contact specific departments and ask them to put a call out to students um, for people who are studying in the areas that we need and may want experience for example sports management and communication students always looking for webcast uh, people as well as sport management students who want to get their hands dirty a little bit and learn what they're getting into. Um, so the next point, always train someone in a new position on a slow weekend. This is something I find very important and something I literally try and do every single time if I can, because I want to make my event staff as versatile as possible, because the more versatile they are, the easier it is to schedule people for um, for events when you have multiple events going on at the same time and someone doesn't show up you're able to take someone else and just put them over in the new position without having to worry about training or stressing out about that because they are already aware so you also want to take advantage of your exhibition games i use those um, a lot to train um, our events now the way we work in our department our teams are responsible for their exhibition running their exhibition games um, if they would like to hire, you know, the event staff to work their game, they are more than welcome to do that, but it is on the responsibility of the team. However, if I would like to train someone on a position during one of their games, I take on those added expenses and not charge it back uh, to them. Everyone's a little more relaxed during an exhibition game, so it's the perfect time to, you know, train staff because if they screw up, it's okay. Everybody kind of understands and you talk to the officials and everybody gets it. Um, 
you know, as I said earlier, planning and thinking ahead is one of the most important things and succession planning is something you really need to think about in your event staff too. Um, you want to see who your key students are, whether they're your stats team or your shot clock, those key people, find out when they're graduating and then train their replacements during the season prior to when they're leaving or this, their last season. You want to make sure that um, everyone, there's just an easy succession plan. So there's no, you know, August rolls around and you, all of a sudden you don't have a stats team because you didn't plan ahead. So think ahead, see who's graduating, find out who's interested in replacing them and then continue on. Uh, there. So, and then for me, the most important thing um, is to helping ensure our events run smoothly is making sure our staff arrive on time. I know a lot of people, um, you know, or students and employees, it says, oh, my start time's 4.30. So that's when they stroll into the building. That doesn't cut it for me. 4.30 is your start time, which means 4.30 is the time that you actually start working. So for us, my staff is required to be there at 4.15. They come in the building, they get their coats off, they put it away, they get the, the gab out of them if they haven't seen people since last week and they wanna talk and catch up. Then they do that between 4.15 and 4.30. And then when their shift starts at 4.30, which is when they start getting paid, they are picking up their equipment and walking into the gym. We need to be set up by a certain time and your start time is at 4.30 for a reason. So you need to be working at that time. You can't just be walking into the building because then you're late, the setup is late and everything falls behind from there. Volunteers too are also integral parts of um, running an event, especially large, large events. Um, utilize them when you can. Um, I find our community members are key volunteers for me. For example, my photographers are all uh, volunteers from the community. It's an, I'm very, very lucky there. Um, international students, I find that when you're hosting a large event and you need uh, students, they're some key people. They're new, they're excited, they want to be involved, they want to know what's going on. So you can maybe not give them the 24 second shot clock if they're brand new to the country and they don't actually understand the game, but they are able to help with crowd control. They can help attract meets by breaking the pits or helping, you know, put the pole back up for high jump. Um, there's a lot of different ways to, to uh, utilize your international students and they're always, I find always very excited and eager to get involved. Um, another little thing is the children of your cohort. I know everyone's like, what? No, your coworkers either have teenagers who need volunteer high school hours or they're young kids who just wanna be there and they're excited and you need um, you know, little girls to or boys to present medals and flowers at an awards presentation. It's always good. People love seeing little kids uh, involved in you know, stuff. So utilize them as best you can, give the high school kids their volunteer hours and you know, make the day of some little five-year-old girl who's just excited to be there. Um, and to thank your volunteers, you wanna feed them for large events or if they're gonna be there all day, you know, for a six or 12 hour day, somewhere in there. Um, and then for those volunteers who are around all the time, for example, with my photographers, I provide them with team gear. Um, my photographers probably have just as much Lancer gear as I do, um, but with the amount that they volunteer with me and what they do for me, uh, they deserve it, and I make them feel as part of our team as possible. Okay, now, over, speaking of photographers, <laughs> I have found that when you are running an event, you need a Kevin, a Jerry, and a Peggy. For me, a Kevin is someone who focuses on the game. They take action shots for both teams and they can turn the pictures around to you during the game or immediately following. That's cool. And there's a Jerry. Your Jerry is the photographer who literally takes pictures of everything. Every person playing that day, every coach, every play, fans in the stands, the net, absolutely positively everything. And then if you are lucky, it is beneficial to have a Peggy. It is the player's mom who dabbles in photography and just loves taking pictures and they take all the artsy pictures, the ones of the bench, the celebrations, the emotion, all those little things that the, the photographers cover in the action don't necessarily um, take the time or to not to, to see, but they're just sh busy shooting other things. Um, I'm very lucky to have Kevin, Jerry, and Peggy as my photographers right now. Um, when we have multiple events, we split them all up into um, different uh, different uh, games so that I have everything you know to be covered. Peggy uh, is my 
standard volleyball photographer because her son is on our team. Um, so I have millions of pictures uh, from volleyball. Um, but something I do with them too is at the time, at the beginning of the year, I take time um, and I make a list of what I need from them for each sport. For example, new coaches are graduating players, new players, rookies, anything that's different from the year before that we need updated photos of. I take that list, I break it down and I split it between them. I also give Jerry our list of seniors at the beginning of every season and he works on getting them throughout the year. I find it really important to give the list of athletes to, to them at the beginning of the season, especially for our seniors. Um, so that way you're not scrambling at the end of the year. Like for example, you know, the old linemen in your, on your football team, odds are if they weren't on the list, um, you know, that we need a photo of them, they're just going to be in the bottom of the pile of the photo that's there. They're there, but you can see their arm or just their helmet. So doing that in advance helps um, get them. And then if the season's starting to wind down and that player hasn't played or they haven't had, we don't have a good shot of them, we can talk to the coach to try and make sure that we do have that. Um, my colleagues in the OUA can tell you that when Jerry shoots an event for us and uh, for example, the track and field championships, they get a lot of pictures. He sends me about 500 pictures a game. It's that's at minimum and uh, it's intense, but you know exactly what happened. And someone like Jerry taking all those pictures, he has saved my, he has saved me time and time again. Like in case of emergency, for example, if you have a last second grad that you didn't know about, you can find a picture because Jerry has taken pictures of everything. Or if someone has unfortunately passed away, you know that you're able to find a photo of them you know, from the crowd or someone who's done something for you at a game because Jerry was there taking pictures of everything. For, you know, Jerry saved my life this year for our grad videos. We didn't have any pictures, you know, we didn't have the opportunity to take pictures this year, but because Jerry is so thorough all the time, we have that database and I was able to get the pictures of those old linemen um, that you normally can't find. So, and then obviously for large events, you can't just have one photographer because when an event runs 12 days and there's, you know, at a track meet, for example, six events running at the same time, you need to be able to spread them out, give them breaks and all that kind of stuff. So, okay. Lots of great discussion in the chat, guys. Keep it up. There are lots of people on Slack and Teams, so they're liking that. A lot of people are very jealous of the sport management students, especially those who have to do internships for free. Um, and Andrea at Ryerson does love J Jerry, so. <laughs> <laughs> I figured you guys would have a few nice things to say about him. Okay, any other questions before I move on to a slightly more serious topic? Nope, okay. Um, risk management is something that is also important to us. Um, as it is to all of you, but um, so we have an emergency action plan for all of our different venues and all of our different games. Um, at our meeting at the beginning of the year with the team uh, or with the event staff, we go over our plans uh, very thoroughly and our plan is broken down by position. So if you're on tickets and the fire alarm goes off, this is what you do. If you are on the shot clock, this is what you do. The webcast team does this and we break it down that way. Um, and so what I do to follow up with them uh, to ensure that everyone's on their toes all the time is I'll just randomly walk up to them before a game and say, okay, so you're on shot clock today. What do you do if the fire alarm goes off? What if you do if there's an emergency on the court? And, you know, I, it just keeps them on their toes. Um, that way they always know what's happening. So when in the event that something does happen, everybody's ready to go and no one's, you know, looking around saying, what do I do? What do I do? And it, it helps us keep our, um, the fans calm, the staff calm, the team calm, and everybody calm if things run uh, smoothly and efficiently. Thankfully, we haven't had a fire alarm, knock on wood, at the St. Dennis Center, so uh, it's it's okay there. Um, although prior to hockey too, we do review that every game because it, there's a, just a little bit more risk of injury uh, there. So because we have a turnaround, it, it's a different uh, therapist there necessarily, uh, every game plus, um, different event staff, they always go through and talk prior to every game of who's the contact person, who's calling, and that just to make sure everybody's on the same page as well. And I cannot stress enough to those of you, especially those of you who um, play in community buildings, test your emergency phone. This to me, I know it seems silly, but we 
um, had a literally, it was a life or death situation for us. And my scorekeeper picked up the emergency phone to call the ambulance and it didn't work. It was dead. It went to nothing. So I don't allow my event staff to have their cell phones on them when they're working, except for a few senior students. So thankfully he was my senior student and had his phone on him and was able to call. Um, but I never ever want to have to go through that again. And I don't want anybody to have to go through that. So test your emergency phone. Every year we, we tell the city we're picking up the phone, we're calling on, we're picking it up. I want to hear 911 on the other end. Um, to me, that is really, really important. And thankfully, it all worked out for us in the end. Onto a little bit more of a, well, onto a happier topic for sure, uh, social media. Um, again, as I said, it comes down to planning. You know, you want to plan out your big campaigns and you want to design your graphics early um, because doing that in the summer, when your photo shoot time, like time comes up, you have a list of what pictures you need, right? So they come in and you're like, okay, we need all the regular standard photos of you smiling and crossing your arms and, you know, looking serious and happy and silly. But then you also have the ones, you know, to take for uh, Bell Let's Talk or your breast cancer event or all your holidays and St. Patrick's Day, Christmas, all that kind of stuff. When you have the list, you're able to uh, knock it off really early and then you can get those graphics and that plan done as well in, in advance. Um, creating templates in the summer, obviously like this summer, we're gonna change um, all our scoreboards and you know graphics and stuff for our social media channel. So we're gonna be designing those uh, this summer. Um, you know, it lets you create a new theme and consistency for the year and then you can distribute it to your social media team well in advance so everybody has it uh, and they will be ready. Um, you want, I've noticed for me that when we have more than one social media assistance, things run far more smoothly. Before Instagram, Twitter and all, and TikTok and all that kind of stuff blew up, we only had one promotions assistant and it worked well for us. But since that has kind of taken over how we report um, everything, we have a team of people and they do our social media posting throughout the year, but they also do our in-game promotions. Uh, we find that works really well for us. Um, so they'll take care of all our social media posting for events, except for Twitter, um, which I have here shows that I have one person dedicated to that. I use my social, my uh, sports info assistant as our Twitter um, uh, poster throughout a game. They um, tweet out updates throughout the games. They clip highlights. Uh, so they watch on the webcast and, you know, clip highlights that they can tweet out as well. And then they also write the game recap. I find this really helpful for us um, because they're, they're watching the game, they're reporting it as it's going. So it, for, to me, to have them write the green game recap just makes most sense. Then they send it to me, I get a picture, I post, and I get to go home somewhat early. Now for webcasting, I'll admit that this is an area that I want to improve on. Um, I'm not Ryerson or Guelph or Western who has this like, you know, figured out and have these amazing webcasts. Um, I'm, I would say I'm probably a middle of the pack. We meet, our, we meet our requirements and we do what I can, but this is something that um, I'm working on getting better at. And one of the things to do that is I'm creating internships through our communications department. Um, I want these interns, I would like to have a couple. So one can be based in the gym and one can be based at the arena. Um, I want them to be the producers who plan out each webcast. I want them to train the event staff on the webcasting positions. And I want them to recruit other communications and production students to be on the staff to do this. I think getting those students on your team for webcasting is so important because they're learning about it in school every day. They're able to apply what they're learning and it gives them experience to put on their resume for when they go out into the real world and they're not just cold. Um, something else I'm doing, which I'm really excited about, is I am working on a deal with our local television station um, where they will send a director from their station to our game to run our webcast and be the switcher and the director. And we provide all the equipment and the staff. Um, so what happens is, is my staff, this is great because we have an experienced person running the broadcast. They have more knowledge than anyone and can train everybody properly. And then our game in turn also gets aired on their community station, you know, the next day or later that night. Um, so it's a win-win, both, both teams uh, work together to, pr to produce the game and then it gets aired on both channels. So this is something I'm really looking forward to. 
um, if I can. I'm hoping not for this fall because I don't think it'll be in place for that, but hopefully for next season. Um, and then obviously plan in the summer. Summers are, I know our favorite time because it's nice and calm, but it's also some, like there's a lot to do in the summer as well, as you all know. Um, so, you know, we design our new graphics, we get our commercials from our sponsors well in advance, hopefully from the conference offices as well, lay it out, we write all the scripts based on, um, you know, regular season or if there's a big event happening there. So moving on to in-game promotions, um, this honestly doesn't need to be as stressful as some people, um, as it can be, I'll be honest. Um, things we've done to help streamline this and make this something that we don't ha have to spend a whole lot of time on. Uh, one of the things we do is we develop partnerships with our sponsors. Uh, so for example, um, we have a hockey promotion with Chuck's Roadhouse. At the first intermission of every men's hockey game, there's a Chuck's Roadhouse Scoro. And this is great because the, pro the promo is already planned out for us. People get excited for it because they want to win the gift certificate and they're expecting it so they know what to look forward to. And, you know, it's very good. Um, we book a lot of local youth dance teams and local youth basketball teams to come and play at our um, uh, half times. So we just call the dance team over, you know, book them, they come in, we play their music, they do the dance. People love seeing the youth and all the young people, you know, playing basketball or uh, doing a great routine and they get off. So which is wonderful. And then something else we do sometimes, I won't say we do this all the time, but a good idea is to run a contest throughout the season. Um, so run a bracket or some kind of competition and then have the championship and the finale at your final home game of the season. Or if you're hosting a championship or a playoff game that you know of, you can have it, um, you know, the finale be there so that there's some kind of build up. I've also found that you want, there's also, Two other things. Um, we do uh, philanthropic promotions as well, depending on what we have going on. Like for example, with um, Bell Let's Talk or Breast Cancer Awareness Day. Um, as you can see here for Breast Cancer Awareness Day, our football team comes in and puts bras on top of their jerseys. And then at the quarter breaks, they walk through the stands and people stuff their bras with money. It is fantastic. We make a lot of money for um, our breast cancer event because of that. It's something we've been doing for a number of years now, and I'm hoping we can continue it for a long time. Um, and then for big events, like championships and stuff, you wanna go big or you wanna go home. You want to, for example, for us, for when we hosted women's basketball the first time, we brought in the Detroit Pistons flight crew for the gold medal game, and it was so well received. They were amazing. They got engaged with the crowd. They wore Lancer shirts at one point, you know, they're, mascot and our mascot had a whole thing going on and it was just awesome so you want when you have a champion you want your in-game promotions for big championships to be of the same caliber of that championship so that's something you know to keep in mind but it doesn't need to be again a lot of work we've we just booked the flight crew we booked unicyclists to come in we had this giant inflatable joust game it was a lot of fun so in game remember in-game entertainment can be good without you having to do a lot of work so now two of my favorite things that we do, these are one-offs as Jill called them when we were talking. One is our food truck. So I will be one of the first to admit that we are not great at concessions. And so for football, we decided instead of running a concession stand, we would bring in a food truck. Um, we contacted the local restaurant who we knew we had one and there's no money exchanged between our two parties. Um, we don't receive a portion of their proceeds and nor do we pay them to be there. All there is, is a contract that outlines the game days, expectations of arrival and departure, what food is gonna be served and at the price point, what liquor is going to be served in the price point, and they use their own liquor license for this. And they also provide a hand washing station for health and safety purposes. Um, we found this helpful, our fans love it. They sell out of food all the time. Honestly, we open the gate, they pull in, we close the gate, they open the gate, they leave, it's awesome. Honestly, it's one less thing you have to worry about if you can do this. And then the best thing we've ever done, in my personal opinion, is we've hired a DJ. Our DJ, we have a DJ for football, basketball, and volleyball. It's the same company. Um, some of the benefits of this is they always show up. They're always there. Um, music is always current. You never have to worry about the music not being clean. It's always family friendly. You don't have to go through the hassles of 
warm up music and getting it from the team because we pay the bill for this DJ. So we play the music that we want to play. We don't have to worry about going to the teams and to get it um, or have that kind of argument anymore because we do that. Um, we provide them with a game script so that they know what's going on um, ahead of time. If we have specific music we need for a promotion, um, we send it to them in advance of the game so that they're ready um, in advance. And then for us, um, they're an entertainment company. So for a bonus is our, they also provide us with extra special effects for special, um, days that we have going on. So either spotlights or smoke machine or anything else we have going on. Um, they help provide us with that as well. And then we also let them put up a banner, um, on the sidelines. You can see it there, elevate productions. Um, so that's what we do for them. Now, finally, I want to talk about uh, just feedback and follow up. This is something that is really um, important, regardless of what you're doing. Um, most importantly, you want to make sure you thank your staff and your volunteers for a job well done. If you don't take the time to thank them for after a crazy busy weekend when you've had 14 games in two days or three days and they literally lived at the gym, um, if you don't take them, if you don't say thank you, they're going to think that you don't appreciate them. You don't see the hard work that they're doing. And then they're just going to show up for the paycheck and not care and not put in that extra effort. If you take the time to say thank you and provide feedback to them, positive, negative, just engage with them, then they are going to care more and they are going to engage more and they are going to want to work harder for you and for the team because they are engaged and they are involved. Um, if you can, you maybe want to do something for them um, at Christmas time or at the end of the year. Um, I'm able to give my event staff a little $5 uh, Tim Hortons gift card with a Christmas card that I sign and, uh, you know, just to say thank you. And then when we have big event days where we're there for, you know, eight to 12 hours, I'll bring in some snacks for them to eat in between games and stuff like that. And then at the end of the year, we have a really big um, awards luncheon for them as well with all student employees in our department. So just little things to make them feel um, involved. I mean, you guys know how it feels if you do something and it goes really well and no one says anything or acknowledges it. That I, to me, I wanna avoid my staff feeling that way. So I wanna make sure um, to do what I can to help them. And then for obviously post events, uh, you wanna have a follow-up meeting or even just yourself, take five minutes to take some, um, time to write down the good, bad, and the ugly about what happened. As you can see here, this is my first page of my um, athletic banquet follow-up notes that I took. It shows things that went well, things that we want to do for next year. You know, here dinner was long and the chicken was dry. So I'm going to need to have a chat with our event people next year, like the facility, just to make sure that uh, dinner is sp sped up a little bit. I mean, I realize that they're feeding 500 people all at once and we take that into consideration. But it's just those kinds of things. And for example, here, you know, I want to rename a trophy. If I didn't have this note here, I know I wouldn't remember the next year that I want to rename an award. So it's just small things like that. And you, I walk around to all the different people if we don't have time to meet and say, what were your thoughts? What is your feedback? What do you want to do uh, for next year? And I just write it out so that when we meet for the first time the following year, we're already like four or five steps ahead of the game. So... Thank you all so much. I mean, I hope I didn't bore you all too much. Um, as Jill said, you know, with even though I'm 18 years into this, I'm still not done learning. I, poor Trevor and I, we do, both of us, we work in the department, we can't go to a game, like to a professional sporting a game, you know, without looking at the facilities and seeing what they do and, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So I'm always going to other facilities, websites, social media accounts, and I'm learning. I'm always seeing what others do to see what works for them that maybe I can apply to help work for me and help us, you know, become even better or more efficient than what we already do. Thanks. That's awesome, uh, Lisa. I have a couple questions in the chat. Yep. Uh, one from Andrea at Ryerson. Do you run the same promotions at every regular season game or is there a drop off between like a marquee basketball game and a random Sunday afternoon hockey game? Okay, so if we have an agreement with our sponsor, we will do that every game or we'll follow the agreement, um, whatever we've arranged in our agreement. So for example, with the Chuck Scoro, we do it every single men's hockey regular season game. But if we have, you know, 
if Taco Bell, for example, gives us this many prizes, like four prizes, we'll do four big Taco Bell um, promos throughout the year. It'll be the same one, but we'll schedule it out so that it's even and balanced so then people um, you know, are excited for the next game and then they show up. Um, obviously for playoffs, the conference gives us promotions that we have to uh, fulfill, but we try and um, you know, add a few different things here and there. Awesome. Uh, one more from Jamie at Laurier. What's one thing you hear from your fans that brings them back to events over and over? Oh, good question. Um, I think the fact that right now in our current facility, we are a little closer together. So they have that more hands-on feeling. They like, um, our community is really close. I'm not going to lie. Our basketball community is like tight. You go to our games, you go to St. Clair and everybody is kind of always there. Um, and they love watching people grow up from playing young to, you know, playing university ball. But uh, some of the things I think we do um, is we, we do try and engage our fans. We keep it upbeat and um, we run a lot of contests, like do a lot of giveaways, which I think uh, helps our fans come as well. Instead of just watching, um, you know, somebody shoot a basketball, we do, you know, bigger giveaways or bring in entertainment teams. There's never nothing going on. I don't know if that answered your question, Jay. I think that's a good answer. Okay. Um, if there's not any more questions, if there aren't any more questions, sorry. Uh, I'd just like to thank you so much, Elisa. We really appreciate all of the work you did to put this excellent presentation together. Uh, I'm tired of just thinking of all your tasks and you could see clearly on that women's basketball championship list that you had the most tasks by far out of anyone. Um, it's fine. So yeah, if there aren't any more questions, I'm gonna actually turn it over to our Kansida president, Ben Matchett for an update. Ben? I, I, I paid attention, so I'm here. So thanks, Jill. Um, and thanks to Elisa and to all of our presenters over the last uh, three or four months who have been putting on these, um, these webinars. We really appreciate it. We appreciate the, the um, enthusiasm that we've heard from, the, um, from you who are joining us for these and our turnout has been really good. Another 45 here today. So that's uh, really exciting. So we appreciate that. Um, and we also want to hear any feedback that you have on these and uh, topic ideas and things like that. So please feel free to reach out to your, uh, your regional rep who has been the one who's been inviting you to these. Um, if there's other things that you have uh, that would be of interest to you or topic areas that we could cover. Um, just wanted to give a kind of a sense of what we're looking at here over the next month or so um, as we lead up to the COSIDA virtual convention. So the convention dates are set for June 7th to 10th um, and that's entirely online this year and COSIDA.com has more information on that. I believe they're going to be starting registration for that in early May. Um, so you can see that it's totally free. You don't have to be a member of COSIDA to be part of it um, this year, although we certainly encourage you to look at membership options with COSIDA. Um, but that's the registration will start in early May and the virtual convention set for June 7th to 10th. As part of that, we are going to host our Canadian Divisional Day and we're going to do it a little bit earlier. So that's going to be on Thursday, May 27th. So it just kind of keeps the cadence of these webinars the same. Um, and this one's just going to be a little bit more expanded. So in place of what we would do at a typical COSIDA convention, um, where we'd get together for a half day um, in person and talk through some sort of Canadian specific issues and, and professional development. We're going to do that virtually um, on the 27th of May. So more information to come on that, but you can save the date and time for now. Um, it's going to go from about noon Eastern to about 3.30 p.m., um, and it'll be entirely virtual again. So noon to 3.30 Eastern on uh, Thursday, the 27th of May. We're going to have about an hour set aside for, for some business related stuff. So we'll split out into uh, U Sports and CCAA um, groups for just sort of larger national conversations that we'll invite the, or the, the national offices to be part of. And then we'll have two sort of targeted um, topic areas that we will discuss 
um, one in social media management and one in broadcasting is sort of two kind of high level themes that have been brought to us um, that we'd like to have a little bit more um, sort of in-depth conversation on. So those are um, sort of the high level, the broad strokes of what we're going to be looking at that day. I will be sending out either later tomorrow or early next week um, a survey just to get a little bit more help us drill down into specific sort of topic areas within those broad themes um, for breakout sessions that we can set up there. So um, please have a look for that in your inbox and uh, respond to that as soon as you can so we can get moving on this because we're four weeks away, I think, from this. So um, we got a little bit of work to do. But again, thank you all so much for uh, your engagement in these sessions. We appreciate it. We weren't sure what it was going to look like when we started these. And uh, to have 40 to 50 every time has been um, really, really positive to see. And of course, appreciate all of our, uh, um, our presenters and uh, panelists and everyone who have been part of it as well. So I'll leave it there. If you have any questions now, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, you can have seven minutes of your day back. Got a question from Pearl, Earl the Pearl. Hold on. Uh, there we go. Can you hear me? Ben, you were, you were just, you were mentioning that the, we're going to talk about some Canadian issues. Just wondering if the, there was any plan to discuss uh, where the Stanley Cups can be played in Canada or in the States or what we're going to do about that. Um, we could, we could add that to the agenda. Absolutely. I'm not sure how much, um, how much sway we have, but Connor, maybe I know Edmonton rules the NHL right now. So maybe Connor. Can, uh... They didn't last night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good to see you, Pearl. Great to be here. All righty. I think that's it. Thanks everyone for attending and a big thank you again to Elisa for all her great work. That was an awesome presentation and uh, hope everyone has a great rest of your day.